looking at the gunpowder empires, which occupy the Middle East um, in the 15th to 18th centuries. So we're essentially looking at what's happening in the Middle East uh, during the same time as the Renaissance era in Europe. Um, so there are generally three empires that we associate with the gunpowder age of the Islamic empires. The largest and most monumental was the Ottoman Empire. Um, and then there was the Safavid Empire, which is in present-day Iran. And then you have the Mughal Empire, which uh, was in present-day India and Pakistan. So all of the empires were made up of Turkish-speaking uh, people. Uh, so they were very diverse in terms of their ethnicity. Uh, they came from a variety of areas. So they came from Southwest Asia, so essentially Asia Minor, where the Ottoman Empire will develop. Uh, they're also coming from Central Asia, so they're coming from the steppe regions as well as the areas that they eventually settle. And then they're also coming from South Asia, so they're coming from India itself. Many of the people who made up the gunpowder empire, empires actually were descendants of Mongols. In fact, the Mughal Empire in India um, translates into Mongol. So we're seeing that all of these societies, even though they do differ in some ways, have similar reasons for their rise. All of them were militaristic in nature, hence the name gunpowder. All of them are taking advantage of the military technologies of this era to start conquering weaker areas. So when we say gunpowder, we're discussing heavy artillery and even more importantly, the use of the cannon. Um, they, and it, even though they are uh, mainly militaristic, they do have some pretty significant artistic and architectural legacies. So we'll be looking at some really famous structures that still very much make up uh, the historical architecture of this area. Um, we will see that they all decline for similar reasons. Um, uh, the Ottomans in particular start to decline as Western Europe gets much stronger economically and militarily. Um, this uh, happens in particular because Western Europe starts to build up stronger navies, which these empires cannot compete with, particularly, particularly the Safavid Empire, which had little to no navy whatsoever, despite their location on the Persian Gulf. Um, so essentially what happens is even though these empires did have a strong military in their early years because of their use of gunpowder, they don't really modernize their military, develop a sufficient navy, and so they're consequently going to fall. The, uh, an interesting counterpart to the fall of these empires is that Russia is able to actually remain strong enough to survive as an independent city-state. So we talked about Russia right before this unit, um, realized that one of the things that Russia does that keeps its military strong is it starts to westernize during the ages of uh, Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, which allows their military, even though it's not as advanced as Western Europe, they stay more on par uh, by comparison to these uh, gunpowder empires to the south. Um, the Ottoman Empire, again, was the last empire to fall. Um, it doesn't come to an end until the, uh, World War I, um, and that's when modern Turkey forms. The Safavid and Mughal empires are going to fall uh, much sooner. So uh, again, let's talk about the origins of these people. Um, they're all Turkish in origins. They're all coming from the Asian steppes region. Um, they all are Muslim, although there is going to be a Sunni-Shia divide. The majority of people who make up this region are going to be Sunni, but the people who settle in the Safavid Empire are largely Shia. And as we see again from this map here, the Safavid Empire is in the center. So one of the reasons why they are going to get weaker is they're not particularly religiously tolerant, and they're experiencing a lot of tension with the Sunnis that border them both to the west and to the east. Um, other things that they all have in common... They're all going to be very strong autocratic states. We're going to see that the emperors um, try to centralize the rule as much as they can. They impose their will on the state. They try to develop efficient bureaucracies, although as the uh, emperors become a little bit more corrupt as time goes on, the bureaucracies will be able to sort of take advantage of their positions and, and become more corrupt and, for example, take advantage of the peasantry by sort of uh, taking more of their fair share of the tax revenues and so on. Um, you're also going to see as time goes on, there's going to be more problems with the royal successions. Um, this in particular develops in the, um, in the Ottoman Empire when you have a growing importance of the harem political system. So women 
who associate in a harem um, actually start to really try to influence who the next uh, leader is going to be. Um, so they try to promote their sons ahead of all others. Um, you also have instances with some of these uh, rulers of uh, actually killing their own family members to take control of the throne. So like Ottoman empires, for example, oftentimes would kill a bunch of their brothers so that they would ensure their legitimacy. Um, as I just said, uh, women actually are going to have a fairly influential role in the political systems of many of these empires. The Ottoman Empire is a very good example of this because of this harem culture that develops. A harem was basically where the women lived and um, in a, a Muslim household, and because they associated with one another, because um, they were all related uh, or associated with the sultan in some way, right? So they're the wives, the sisters, the daughters, the aunts, and the mother of the sultan all living together. Um, they're living in a powerful place. They also live amongst eunuchs who uh, start who actually come to protect many of these women. Um, both women and eunuchs are eventually going to have considerable influence. Um, the children are also raised in the harem and they're not allowed out until their teenage years. And so a lot of times with this harem politics that develops, uh, women are going to have more influence over politics. They're going to have more of an influence over selecting the future heir. And uh, the harem politics does eventually start to diminish the power and the, uh, the high position of the sultan. Uh, all three of the gunpowder empires came to rise uh, for similar reasons. Um, again, uh, the major similarity between all of them is that they're Turkish and Muslim in uh, background. Um, they speak a variety of the Turkic family of languages, and all of them also were taken advantage of uh, sort of a power vacuum that exists in the uh, breakup of the Mongol Khanates that used to occupy these areas. So we know that uh, all these Ottoman, em or, sorry, all these Muslim gunpowder empires are coming of age around the uh, mid 1400s. This is when the Mongols are all declining in influence, as you can remember. Remember, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, it's it's not surprising that Russia comes to rise at a similar time period, right? Um, the Ming Dynasty started to rise in the 1300s because the, um, the Mongol Yuan Dynasty did decline slightly earlier. You get the idea. When the Mongols decline, these, these places are going to pick up where they left off. Um, again, they're very militaristic. They rely on armies that have strong artilleries and they also have cannons. Um, so the initial successes of all these gunpowder empires was based on their military might. Um, and um, another reason why they're so successful is because at this time, um, this is when many European nations are actually sort of conflicting amongst themselves. And so that's going to uh, sy symbolize sort of a lack of, of unity in Europe. Um, and so basically these empires can get stronger um, and start to challenge the legitimacy of, of some of the European uh, some of the European kingdoms, right? And at the height of the Ottoman Empire, for example, we're going to see that they push pretty far into Europe. So they're taking advantage of some of the weaknesses that exist um, before the absolute monarchies get quite strong. Um, Tamerlane is the first important leader that we should know. Uh, I just realized his face is eclipsing his date. So Tamerlane uh, rules from 1370 um, to... Uh, you know what? I don't actually have his end year. I actually have the empire year in total. Uh, so Tamerlane uh, takes power in 1370, and the last um, uh, ruler of his empire um, is going to uh, rule until 1507, when uh, Tamerlane's empire is going to decline. And about 15 years after that, you have the beginning of the Mughal Empire in India that takes over the more eastern portion of Tamerlane's empire. Um, so Tamer Lane, his uh, name was actually Timur, T-I-M-U-R, uh, but he takes the nickname Tamer the Lame because he uh, had a physical disability. He was a Mongol Turkic ruler of the late 14th century, and he uh, led an army that was partly um, comprised of nomadic invaders from the broad steppes of Eurasia. Um, they move out of the trading city of Samarkand, which you can see here. That was in modern-day Uzbekistan. And they start to make ruthless conquests farther west in Persia, so in modern-day Iran and India, right? So basically, uh, Tamerlane brings his, uh, his nomadic uh, military group west and starts to conquer areas. Um, the Eurasian steppes uh, adopted sort of... Uh, 
a mentality that was called the Ghazi ideal. And what this was was a model for the warrior lifestyle that blended the cooperative values of nomadic culture with a willingness to serve as a holy fighter for Islam. So this combination was sort of ideal for someone like Tamerlane. Uh, it also serves as a good model for all the warriors who participate in the rise of uh, all the gunpowder empires. So basically you have this good a combination of nomadic people who are also Muslim and, and are sort of following uh, the principle of conquering uh, uh, conquering in a jihadi fashion to make uh, the uh, influence of Islam stronger. Um, Tamerlan's uh, takeover of Central Asia was quite violent. Um, he actually massacre, massacred about 100,000 Hindus before uh, Delhi was formed in India. Um, and the violence marked the pattern of conquest that resulted in the rise of the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal dynasties. So this is obviously a common pattern that these places all are expanding through conquest. Um, Tamerlane was not only well known for his military contributions, he also contributed quite heavily to the culture of the area. Um, he was very learned. He um, was very interested in the arts. He championed uh, literature. He was very passionate about, about promoting literacy in his empire. He was very interested in European culture as well. He corresponded with many European rulers. And he also uh, made his mark in history by writing his own memoirs. So you can see based on Chamberlain's leadership that, that education and literacy was, was quite significant in his empire. He's also very interested in architecture, and we can see that some of the buildings that still stand in Samarkand show how interested it is he, he is in architecture and the decorative arts. They very certainly spread uh, many uh, Muslim and Middle Eastern styles throughout their empire. This is uh, uh, Tamerlane's mausoleum, so where he was eventually buried, but you certainly see a, a very Islamic uh, influence over the architecture in this region. So the legacy of Tamerlane, um, was first, we see uh, how significant um, gunpowder is in establishing an empire. Um, Tamerlane not only used it to build a government that was dependent upon his military, but he also um, used gunpowder to protect his empire once it was uh, established. And he also was protecting land routes along the Silk Road, so he uses gunpowder both as a form of conquest as well as a form of defense. One of the problems with Tamerlane's rule is that he didn't really leave an effective political system in the areas that he conquered. So we're going to see eventually um, the economy is going to decline. There isn't an effective government. Um, the wars that he conducted were quite expensive. So, uh, so Tamerlane's empire doesn't last particularly long. It is effectively gone by the early 1500s and is going to be replaced by the Mughals. His rule also really highlights um, the major forces that keep battling each other, um, really from the 10th century to the 14th century. So on the one hand, we see that these uh, empires are continuously challenged by the Mongols to the northeast. They're also challenged by Islamic forces from Arabia and the areas around the Mediterranean Sea. And we're going to see that these forces really clash continuously uh, throughout the rise and fall of the three Asian gunpowder empires. All right, so we are going to stop here. We're going to pick up with a new video about the Ottoman Empire, and then we'll do two future videos about the Safavid and Mughal Empire. So we'll have four videos in total for this.